coming up on Global Business. China's consumer price index experienced a monthly increase in July, evidence of an ongoing recovery in consumer demand. Last month was the hottest July on record, with abnormally high temperatures recorded on both land and sea, and we look at the economic impact. As rescue and relief efforts continue in flood-stricken areas in China, insurance companies are handling large sums of claims. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business, I'm Lili Lu. Let's start with a look at the latest inflation data from China. The country's Consumer Price Index, or CPI, which is the main gauge of inflation, rose on a monthly basis in July as consumer demand continued to recover. On a yearly basis, however, CPI declined 0.3 percent, mainly due to the high base in the same period of last year, that is according to official figures. In the meantime, China's producer price index in July was down 4.4 percent from a year earlier. PPI decline narrowed both month-on-month -month and year-on-year. -year. The Chinese government was, has rolled out a flurry of policies to support the economy and has more measures in the pipeline. And to learn more about the latest inflation data and the outlook for further monetary policies, we are now joined by Professor Han Qian from Lingnan College and Sam Yusam University. Professor, uh, let's talk about the numbers. So it was an increase month on month, but softened on a yearly basis. Uh, what are the main factors behind July's figures? Oh, yes. Uh, I guess uh, one of the uh, very important reasons is because of the uh, food prices. As we know that uh, last month, uh, there's a, a large supply of fresh vegetables and eggs, uh, so that uh, causes the, uh, the food prices to fall down. And we know that the food price is one of the uh, very important elements of the CPI. Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe another uh, possible reason is that uh, uh, the, the current CPI does not include uh, heavy weight uh, does not include a heavy weight on the demand for services. But uh, uh, if you compare with uh, on a uh, on a year on year basis, then uh, we know that last year we don't uh, uh, we are still we were still in a pandemic period and people do, does not have too much uh, uh, demand for services. But things have uh, changed a lot uh, this year, right? So. Uh, people uh, uh, have a lot of demand for services, but that's not included in the CPI. So that may be another reason for the, the drop, the drop uh, of the CPI on a yearly on year basis. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point there. And now let's look at PPI numbers. Factory gate prices are largely affected by uh, global commodity prices. So lower factory gate prices does have an impact on the economy, both upside and downside. Could you elaborate more on that, please? Yeah, I guess uh, to answer that question, we have to uh, uh, differentiate between uh, uh, whether you know wh whether the, the, the falling uh, PPI is due to a fall a falling uh, investment demand or a falling of uh, profit. Uh, because if, if if it is due to, uh, I guess one have to look carefully into the structure of the PPI. Uh, if it is really due to the falling down of the uh, investment demand for uh, companies, factories, then that could have, have a very important long-term uh, impact on the economy because that means that uh, the supply side will, uh, will start to shrink. But uh, well, uh, that, again, uh, that, need to, uh, that needs a, a more detailed uh, look at the, at the data. So on the back of those economic data that we have collected lately, what sort of uh, monetary policy adjustments are needed? Well, I, I think that, uh, that does not necessarily mean that we will intervene with uh, active uh, monetary policy or fiscal policy, because mm -hmm. what is more important, I think, is uh, to figure out what's the real reason or cause uh, of the falling down of the PPI and the PPI. Uh, for example, if 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 uh, the falling prices is because of the uh, shrink of, uh, is because of the increase of the supply, then it really does not need any intervention uh, of policy. Uh, however, if it, if the falling prices is do, is from the demand side, uh, in particular, if uh, the, the 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 coming uh, employment data uh, uh, is not as 
uh, as good as expected, then that, that possibly means that we should intervene uh, uh, with a more active uh, monetary policy and uh, expansionary uh, fiscal policy. Okay, all right. So all eyes on more economic data being rolled out in the coming weeks. Thank you so much. That's Professor Han Chen. Okay, thank you. Thank you from Lingnan College at Sun Yat-sen University. Well, China has been ramping up efforts to expand consumption of various fronts, including the home appliance sector. And earlier this month, the central government issued measures to spur consumption of household goods and services, from furniture to smart home appliances. Household devices that typically can be customized with a smartphone app. More and more people are looking for a few special appliances to have in their living space that they can control remotely. In Junyi takes a closer look. As people increasingly feel the need for relaxing, learning and spending time with the family at home, living rooms have become more important. And that means a growing market for furniture with smart abilities and smart home appliances that can make the living space more versatile. At the smart home item store in downtown Shanghai, everything from curtains to lighting to the aircon can be accessed and managed remotely via this monitor. They are all becoming increasingly popular. The number of our daily customers has almost doubled now, and around 80% are younger people. Previously, we only considered a home to be a living space. But now, there is an increasing demand for high-quality lifestyles. What we provide is a whole house smart home solution. So the central control module is most popular, as we use it to manage the other smart devices. Of course, stuffing houses with futuristic Internet of Things tech and smart devices means higher costs. But industry insiders say consumers are becoming more enthusiastic about the tech, despite the higher prices. To have a smart home, People will definitely spend more on the smart devices and the wiring. But many of those devices can help users save time and offer them an improved living space with a variety of functions, which are worth the extra money. And with the development of the country's manufacturing sector, we now see more smart devices coming into market, and they are more accepted by consumers. So despite the higher costs, we see a growing demand for the smart home solutions. And recognizing the trend, the Ministry of Commerce last month announced more support will be given to smart home appliance makers as well as to decoration companies. That's part of efforts to further boost consumption demand in the home decoration sector, which she says should be strong support for an economic recovery. Uh, the home decoration industry has a long industrial chain. There are now around 150,000 decoration companies nationwide, and that means there are around 15 million related upstream and downstream companies. More supports given to the industry will strongly support economic growth. According to Xi, the market value of China's home decoration sector is now around 4 trillion yuan. In Junyi, ISIS for CGTN, Shanghai. In the first half of 2023, China consumed nearly 555 tons of gold. That is up more than 16% on the year. But diamonds seem to have lost their attraction. Our reporter Xu Hua has more from the southern Chinese city of Shenzhen. That's China's biggest distribution center for wholesale jewelry. We are at Shenzhen Street Bay Jewelry Market, the largest wholesale market of its kind in China. The market has been crowded with consumers from all over the country for months as the international gold price continues to rise. Let's go and see what the best seller is here. The hustle and bustle of the Shui Bay Jewelry Market since the beginning of 2023 marked a strong comeback from last year. With attractive designs, diverse styles and low prices, Dozens of deals can be reached in seconds. Shui Bei is well known for its gold sales. The quality of gold is more reassuring than other places. We are about to get married. We prefer to buy some gold rather than diamonds for inheritance or for wearing. China's domestic consumption of gold jewelry reached 555 tons in the first half of 2023. Among the gold consumption, the purchase of gold bars jumped 30 percent year on year to 146 tons, while that of gold jewelry reached 368 tons. 
up almost 15 percent from the same period last year. In 2023, our gold sales increased by 20 to 30 percent compared with the last year. By contrast, the doorways of neighboring diamond stores looked relatively lonely as the precious gems lost some significant value over the last few months. The retail transaction volume of diamond inlays is relatively low, and the wholesale sales of our diamond inlays is also declining. The sales of diamond jewelry have declined slightly, partly due to falling prices, fewer marriages, the impact of cultivated diamonds, and changing buyer behavior. For daily social needs, some consumers look to art jewelry as an alternative to diamond jewelry. Our sales of art jewelry in the first half of this year have increased by about 300 percent over the whole of last year. Some economists say the booming gold sales are a direct reflection of a gloomy economic outlook. When people feel about unconcern, uncertainty about the future, especially on the economy, especially about the income growth, people will think to change their investments platform from the variety of the financial products to hard currencies such as gold, such as real estate. However, Wu says that the real estate market hasn't looked good since the beginning of the last year, so Chinese consumers and investors have been looking at other products. While it, proper stimulative policies are still needed to ensure a healthy market and economic rebound. Xu Hua, CGTN, Shenzhen, Guangdong Province. You're watching Global Business on CGTN. Still to come on the program. Last month was the hottest July on record with abnormally high temperatures recorded on both land and sea. And we discussed the economic impact. We are all connected. Across borders. Across continents. Connected by ideas. A shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back. July was the hottest month on record, with abnormally high temperatures recorded on both land and sea. That is according to the European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Panel. Scientists highlighted the urgent need for ambitious efforts to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, which are the main driver behind the record. In the meantime, the extreme weather has caused damage around the world. In the U.S., at least two people died and over one million homes and businesses lost power on Monday as severe storms moved through the country. And in Japan, about 166,000 households were without power as Typhoon Kanun continued to bring heavy rain and gusty winds. China's National Observatory has maintained a blue alert for Typhoon Kanun on Wednesday, as it's expected to bring another spell of rainfall to the northeastern provinces. Heavy rainfalls are expected to hit Jilin and Heilongjiang beginning on Thursday, with some areas facing potential rainstorms. The rains are likely to last into Saturday. The National, National Meteorolo uh, Meteorological Center also anticipates rainstorms in areas south of the Yangtze River, parts of the southern China and Yunnan province over the next three days. China's insurance companies have received a large number of claims from flood-hit areas, and Zhang Xixuan explains how the companies are using modern technology to speed up reimbursement. In recent days, flooding in North China has stranded residents, washed away bridges and highways, and forced tens of thousands of people out of their homes. China's insurance firms have received a flood of claims from people and companies affected by the flooding and the geological disasters it has triggered. Fortunately, the insurance companies were ready. Previously, the insurance claims processes for huge catastrophes were complicated. Now with tech support and cooperation with meteorology departments, we have been studying the relationship between the breeding and agricultural sectors and natural disasters. We have set up trigger conditions which, once triggered, will automatically initiate claims. For agricultural businesses, the company now offers what is called parametric insurance. 
policies with premiums set according to the magnitude of an event rather than by the amount of losses actually incurred. And that makes payouts faster and more flexible. The insurance companies are also introducing technologies to alert clients to the need for risk prevention and alerting them before huge potential losses take place. We combine our geospatial technology with information on the history of our claims and risk situations in different regions. For Daksuri this time, we sent instructions on disaster preparation to 63,978 clients. And we sent our engineers to support 3,740 key clients. We can also offer a visual forecast 1 to 10 days ahead, and a 2-hour short-term forecast, to help clients avoid risks. The company also utilizes Internet of Things devices at clients' warehouses, so as to send alerts when a water level exceeds a safety limit. Foreign insurance firms have also been launching similar products. Swiss Re this year launched parametric insurance coverage for typhoons in China. We have uh, issued a few policies to large corporates and we are in talk with some small, medium-sized uh, enterprises in China and also in talk with certain uh, some government in, in, in order to promote this business in China. From recent trend, we see the uh, the, the, the comp corporates and the government uh, in the coastal area, in the east coastal area, is more interested of, of this. Uh, I think probably because they are more exposed to natural catastrophe events and most concentrated in the assets in the development area. According to Swiss Re's latest report, natural disasters last year brought global economic losses of 275 billion US dollars, of which insurance covered 45% or 125 billion dollars. Much of that is attributed to climate change, economic distortion and inflation, putting more pressure on risk pricing. The report predicts that the higher premiums and tighter terms and conditions will likely continue. Experts say, however, that China's catastrophe insurance is still at a lower coverage level compared with global markets, so there's still room for growth. The majority of insurance companies are offering property all risks coverage, but not many companies are offering detailed products like Typhoon Parametric Insurance. Such products are more common overseas, where development time has been longer and so there are more diversified products. The National Financial Regulatory Administration says that as of 10 a.m. yesterday, Insurance companies in Hebei, Beijing, Heilongjiang, Jilin, and Tianjin have received 117,600 claims, mainly related to automobiles, company property, and agriculture. Estimated losses set out in the claims total 5.37 billion yuan, of which insurance firms have already settled 22,600 claims, paying out a total of 190 million yuan. Zhang Shuxuan, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. China is working toward introducing financial tools to mitigate climate-related risks. Last year, the country released guidelines on how to cope with an increasing number of cases related to extreme weather, and among which financial products such as futures and options were considered as an integral part in managing climate risks from production to consumption. The Dalian Commodity Exchange has been at the forefront of studying weather derivatives. And last year, last week though, the Futures Exchange said that two insurers have attached 3 million yuan worth of contracts ready to compensate fish farmers. Possible losses caused by the extreme heat can thus be transformed to a firm engaging in derivatives business. The contract has been based on a temperature index that was co-launched by the Dalian Commodity Exchange and its partner, that's the National Meteorological Center, that's China's national forecaster. And the index will define extreme heat as a condition that triggers compensation. And now to dive deeper into the risks extreme weather poses for the financial sector, we're now joined by Mr. Shen Yang, Director of the Inclusive Development Research Center. Mr. Shen, great to have you on the show. So as extreme weather continues to disrupt economic activities around the world, what kind of advice would you give to investors? Well, I think uh, a lot of uh, financial agencies, they used to consider different criteria for their investment. Now they need to consider more criteria. For example, a lot of financial agencies already have this uh, green finance agency, climate finance, 
we concentrate on mitigation. But I think uh, due to the extreme weather happening often and often, more often and often, they have to think about the, the adaptation indicators of climate change. Otherwise, you know, they, 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 they may, you know, meet great losses. So in that case, I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of traditional sector, transportation sector, agriculture sector, even, you know, the housing mortgage, a lot of even insurance, a lot of those, you know, financial agencies need to, you know, reevaluate their previous, you know, uh, configuration criteria. Now, speaking of which, could you elaborate a bit more on how extreme weather conditions are impacting the financial industry specifically? Uh, yes, uh, I think, for example, uh, so uh, the, the heavy rainfall uh, made a lot of damage in infrastructure, uh, like, a, like a highway, like a, a fast railway, uh, like uh, also hydro, hydraulic structures, uh, even housing. So in, uh, if we use the previous you know, indicators to consider all the risks, so it can make uh, great losses, you know, uh, even for insurance company or equity investment or long, uh, long investors. Mm -hmm. So uh, if uh, we can using this kind of, you know, decision support system with those uh, prediction models, uh, for example, this uh, financial risk management models, uh, you know, connected with uh, meteorological or other, you know, uh, uh, models can consider those uh, climate risk and also meteorological risk. So then I think uh, it will be making make the financial agency more, how to say, uh, more easy to control the future risk. Uh, because our weather is now, we have already observed a lot of, you know, heat storms uh, and also typhoon and other, you know, these disasters. Uh, this is uh, for many regions a lot of you know variety of uh, new risk is coming because of the climate change and also the extreme weathers. In this case, I think uh, more indicators and more uh, decision support system experts as here and and the prediction models uh, need to be embedded with the, their you know original decision making uh, you know tools. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Maybe earlier we talked about the uh, Dalian commodity exchange using the futures and options as ways uh, to mitigate the risks. What other financial tools can be used to do so? so well, this is uh, one of the, the, the tools. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so I think uh, for a lot of uh, investors, uh, not only these uh, domestic investors or international investors, all need to consider you know, more, how to say, these uh, this indicators relate to, you know, natural disaster. Uh, and also, uh, they need to work with uh, research agencies uh, to, to redesign their, their, their financial models and also risk models uh, so that uh, they can avoid future, uh, how to say, uh, risk. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think financial agencies should also uh, you know, work with your clients. So not just, you know, uh, how to say, modify their, their own, uh, you know, risk management systems, but also to building the capacity of their customers uh, to join their efforts, uh, try to reduce the, the climate risk jointly. Okay, thank you very much for your insights, Mr. Shen Yi Yang, that's Director of the Inclusive Development Research Center. Farmers all over the world are having to adapt to extreme weather and climate change. For some in Mexico, ancestral techniques may be part of the solution to increase corn crop yields. CGTN's Alaska Bavistock has more. Mexico, the cradle of corn and a country where maize is still the cornerstone of the national diet as well as the national lexicon. Just ask any Mexican what they mean when they compare something to colorful corn. When Mexicans say chulada de maíz prieto or compare something to colorful corn, we are saying that something is very pretty or beautiful. 
This is Mexico's heirloom corn, preserved for generations and now making a comeback, given the Mexican president's ongoing battle to block imports of genetically modified white corn from the US and Canada. It's a natural species which, in times of climate change and growing water scarcity, may hold solutions. In Mexico, over the course of centuries, indigenous people developed corn plants that did not require irrigation. These are seasonal plants which receive only rainwater. Traditionally grown in the more rural areas of this country, but now seen as an eco-friendly alternative, heirloom corn is making a comeback in the market. The market is responding. Products like this corn flour made from colourful ancestral grains rather than imported genetically modified corn are now appearing on Mexico's shelves, a direct result of the resurgence of heirloom corn. This natural criollo corn also brings health benefits compared to its genetically modified descendants. Rogelio Chavez is a nutritionist based in Mexico City. Criollo corn is, is produced in a soil that is much more richer than GMO corn. And a diversity of, of, of good bacteria in the soil is fundamental for gut health. GMO corn is produced with a lot of glyphosate. Just like it destroys the weeds and the, and, the, and the bugs in the soil, it also destroys your microbiome. So it's, it's very important that it's not part of our diet. The more natural corn may yield less food, but it's a better survivor. Es muy importante. In order to face any future challenges, we need genetic diversity in our crops. There is no genetic variation in GMO corn. While in a field of 50,000 natural corn plants, all the plants are different. This allows adaption to new diseases and a change in climate, which guarantees the survival of the plant. Amid a changing global climate, the country which gave corn to the world may have the answer to this vital plant's survival. Alastair Baverstock, CGTN, Mexico City. And with that, I'm concluding this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lily Lou in Beijing. Please stay tuned for more to come on CGTN.